We know grazing of ruminants can dramatically improve grasslands, which are the majority of our agriculture lands, and store massive amounts of carbon. There are great examples around the world, from Gay Brown in the US to Kenya with Savory, Australia, UK, etc. But how do we get thousands of farmers slash ranchers to change their grazing practices in the next couple of years? One-on-one trainings are just not going to scale fast enough. And even after training, most farmers, rightfully so, won't risk their mass, these massive changes on their farm because they carry all the risks. So how do we change this paradigm? And how do we use the exploding soil carbon markets and satellite tech to make this happen? This is the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, where we talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities, and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land and our sea, grow our food, what we eat, wear and consume. And it's time that we as investors, big and small, and consumers start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. To make it easy for fans to support our work, we launched our membership community. And so many of you have joined us as a member. Thank you. If our work created value for you, and if you have the means, and only if you have the means, consider joining us. Find out more on gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. That is gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. Or find the link below. Welcome to another episode. Today with Johannes Scheiber, the founder of Rumi, the satellite grazing app. Financing land regeneration, Rumi works with farmers and companies to create the conditions for a better future. Welcome, Johannes. Hi. Nice to be on. And yeah, so nice to have you. I mean, the satellite grazing app, already those two words together, satellite and grazing, we're going to unpack that for sure. But I would love to first unpack a bit your background story. Like, how did you end up founding this company, first of all, working on this issue? And like, when did you get hooked on soil? Like, what's the, that, that, that's always my, my first question. Like, how did you get into this, this crazy rabbit hole that uh, soil carbon can be and soil in general can be? Um, yeah. Uh, so we are three co-founders at uh, Rumi and uh, we met while working uh, at Daimler on, on self-driving taxis. Um, and, uh, very different sector. Yes, very different. Um, and yeah, we were, we had an office in Berlin. Um, and in uh, late 2019, there were these massive protests from farmers in Berlin protesting against the new uh, legislations that are coming, uh, which is, I guess, similar to what's happening in the Netherlands right now. Uh, so you've probably heard a lot about that also in, in the media recently. Um, and so the, the three of us turns out we have some background in farming or like I grew up on a, in a really small village. We had sheep when I grew up. Um, Patty, uh, second co-founder, um, he, they have beef, uh, cattle in, in their family. Daniel also small village where he grew up, um, farmers all around and in the family. Um, and to us, this really made a big impact and we just felt like we perhaps uh, have been a little bit too far removed from where we came from uh, during our professional life. Right. So we, we just lived in big cities, uh, yeah, only working there uh, working on problems for cities uh, or like solutions for problems that are, exist only in cities. And then we have farmers, right, who produce our food, who take care of the majority of our ecosystem, right? And they, they are really in, in uh, having big problems and are in trouble. And they don't really need self-driving. No, taxes. exactly. Uh, that, that's also something we thought. What is what are actually the applications for for what we're building here? Who's going to use this? And is it really going to make this massive impact pack to justify us uh, devoting our lives to it? Um, and we decided that not. Uh, that we need to do something different. Um, but all three together as well. Yeah. Like, was that an interest? Like, was that a sort of? I wouldn't say aha moment, but like because it could be like one of you said, okay, I'm I'm not no longer going to work on self-driving taxis. I'm going to leave and go on a journey to figure out mm-hmm. uh, farming, but actually you decided as a group to do yeah, so, it, which is yeah, interesting. So we were first uh, was Danny and I, and actually two others um, who thought, hey, let's try this together. Um, then two people left and it was just Danny and I, and but Patty joined instead. Um, so, but, uh, you know, we, we all knew each other and been working on this, uh, yeah, or like discussing it, this, this topic. Um, and we were just trying to figure out also by talking to farmers, what, what the problems are, right? And, uh, why are all farmers so dependent on these agricultural inputs, right? Uh, like, 
Yeah. How did you land on that? Like, how did you, because going from, okay, we need to do something about the issues farmers and challenges farmers have going to, to do something actually like physically, like it, it's a big step. Like you went on a learning journey yeah. and you remember when that hit you that, that the input side is, is both the challenge and the opportunity. I think it was just talking to a lot of farmers. Um, so we, we actually first we thought we we're going to do something with uh, organic wine producers and using drones to help them apply fertilizer, like organic fertilizer. Um, but then we thought, okay, the market is too small. Drones are too difficult kind of thing. And then uh, just talking to farmers in, in the family, um, also to uh, Benedict, who's been uh, on, on your show a couple of times. Um, uh, and we just basically learned... Yeah, just by, by talking to all kinds of farmers and understanding how they how they see the world, but also just looking at statistics, right? Um, and that kind of made us understand that that's a problem and, and maybe where the problem comes from, right? So if, if a farmer is dependent on these inputs, at the same time the government is saying, you need to stop using those inputs, right? Then, then you have a, a massive conflict. And we, we were, but we also saw that there are some farmers who do things differently. Um, and first we thought, okay, we're going to help all kinds of farmers, right, uh, to to um, move away from these inputs and to help them w uh, detect basically when when their crops are in, in uh, bad health, uh, when they need water, and, and all of these things. And then we learned, okay, you can't actually irrigate uh, arable land in Germany in most areas. There's just no water close enough. <laughs> so just like learning, uh, you know, get, getting into a completely new industry, knowing nothing. Um, yeah, and and then I guess like at some point it made click that the uh, the ruminants. Like, so that's why we also call it Rumi, right? Uh, that they actually need to be at the heart of the uh, solution, right? They're not the, 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 the problem, right? Like it's been said many times before this, like it's not the cow, it's the how, right? You, uh, and, and we need to. It's even a documentary and a book actually yeah. of, uh, Sarah. <laughs> exactly. yeah. Definitely recommend it if you want to learn more about that. Yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll look into that. Um, but did you, did you, like, when did that click? Because it's very easy, I think, I'm just generalizing, like you're in a big city in Berlin. Um, relatively far away from farmers. I mean, you're going to visit them, etc. But it's potentially easy to to go for a, a fast, uh, easy solution. Might be a bit naive, and and to start a vegan brand or to to go for okay, we have to cut out the animals because the animals are the issue. Like, but to go beyond that and go to, I mean, of course, if you visit Benedict, you you will, you will get a a one on one on what's the role of animals. But that still, you need to be able to uh, you need to be open to absorbing that, and then and then. Have working on that instead of saying no, 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 we have to cut out all animals. Like, did you go into it with a certain idea of it's better to to get rid of the the, the animal piece, or did you go into it? Okay, we have to find a way to make them part of the yeah. solution instead of part of the yeah. problem. Um, I think so. One thing is that so so I'm not a vegetarian or anything. Uh, Daniel actually is so our third co-founder, um, but I always felt like because I grew up in a village, animals are part of what you do and, and you can actually keep animals in a sustainable way. That, that was just my conviction that it must be possible. Um, and I think as, so Patty, he, um, is a, a designer and he, he just does a lot of user interviews. He's probably done like a million or so throughout his whole career, right? And, and just to keep digging and keep digging and keep asking questions. Um, that, that's really what he's really good at. And I don't know, maybe probably had a hundred farmer interviews within two months or so, right? That was in early 2021. Uh, just to really, really uh, focus on, on what, what the issue is. And I think that's, that's helped us just to the curiosity to, to understand first. And I, I guess that was really driven by, by Patty. And I just keep asking these questions. Like we had like sometimes three, four hour interviews with farmers, right? They love talking about this issue. Um, and they, they were kind of also excited to see like someone from completely outside of the industry is, uh, is showing so much interest sitting down and really asking questions yeah. which is not i mean i think many people come up and, and come with their uh, drones to help or get fertilizer <laughs> and try to sell that or come with their their super technical solutions yeah. without ever taking the time to do 100 farmer interviews of three hours yeah. and really digging 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 keep asking why yeah, why yeah. why and i mean it's famously said i think if you ask why three times you get to a very core of, of the issue and, and in this case you discover the core of the issue for you is that the rumen inside is is not being it, it's it's part of the problem instead of part of the solution and something or many things are blocking uh, farmers and ranchers or whatever we want to call yeah. people that uh, that have ruminants to um i would almost say use them optimally use of mm -hmm. course between brackets but to to unleash the power let's yeah. say of the ruminants so what did you, did you discover as were the biggest barriers there for for farmers to 
to use that power mm -hmm. to to work in the ecosystem instead of yeah. fighting against it. Um, so one thing we've found is in uh, talking to a lot of German farmers that uh, like the 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 wisdom currently seems to be that it's the best thing to keep your animals inside. Um, and um, like you know, if you want to have like an organic label or um, what's called uh, Weidemilch, right? So like the the milk that um, gets produced from animals that are outside, they have pretty small requirements, right? So it's like twelve hours a day for I don't know one hundred sixty days a year, um, right? But the the wisdom, so the bare minimum, exactly. Minimum, minimum, yeah. uh, and what we found is also like so for beef cattle, um, it just for most farmers just seems to be okay. Yeah, we have some pasture. Uh, where we can't really do anything else, so we just put some cattle there. But it's it's completely irrelevant to our whole business. Um, so that was kind of devastating for us as well to see. Um, and what we found is that in the UK, it's it's very different. There's uh, just like a different culture around grazing uh, with uh, beef, uh, sheep, and dairy cattle. You, you have longer uh, grazing seasons. Um, it seems like to us, and and grazing is is more part of the farming culture as well. Um, and I think there we could you say stayed more part like it'd be uh, I mean it, I'm imagining a hundred years ago was pretty much the same and and so how did that why did that not maybe change so much in the UK or was it that is that cultural connection to I don't know seeing animals in the land or, or do you have any idea if this is pure speculation <laughs> like why those two countries went so far apart That's interesting yeah mm. because Netherlands and Germany are quite similar right um, as, as one example uh, yeah. and there's a big difference and uh, you also see, like in Germany, you see a big difference between east and west, right? So where the um, you, you have much bigger farms in, in the east, where the you know communists used to be. Um, I don't know. It could be a cultural thing, right? So to try to uh, um, optimize production and to uh, make things more predictable, like in, maybe that's a German thing to do. I'm not sure. The engineering yeah, mind, exactly. yeah, uh, uh, and but then you found a very let's let's say open mind or much more interested group of farmers in the uk like was that a sort of desperate move like okay we, we we don't really we keep knocking on doors in germany and nobody opens the door they keep saying okay animals should be in what are you like what are, what are you telling me a grazing app i don't need a grazing app i need a, a barn app yeah and, and then you say okay let's try another country like how did that come about like why the uk then i think i mean we it's maybe it's a bit opportunistic uh, but also like from hindsight uh, strategically, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so subsidies, for example, they, they have changed a lot in the UK, uh, thanks to Brexit, right? Um, like away from, okay, you, you own a piece of land, you're going to get some money. You need to now show that um, you are, um, like the methods that you're using to, to treat your land are actually sustainable before you get any subsidies. And then there are different tiers for it. In the UK, it's called the Sustainable Farming Incentive. Right, which is the same kind of uh, incentives that they want to have in the EU now as well, but it's going to take some time. But what we saw is, okay, so now these subsidies are gone. The basic payment scheme uh, for farmers in the UK are gone, so they need to change now. Right? They, uh, they, and maybe that was also a catalyst, right? So that there was more urgency for the farmers in the UK. Um, and you know, we just uh, like we had just much more open doors. Maybe that's also a cultural thing that uh, farmers were way more willing to, to talk to us in, in the UK. Um, so we just learned a lot more about UK farming than, um, you know, like, uh, yeah. And, and we, we just gathered, I guess, also more early adopters in the UK than we ever could have maybe in, in, in Germany. And so now what what is Rumi as we currently speak? I mean, obviously in the, the life of a startup, uh, it changes constantly. We're now at the end of the summer in 2022. Um, how would you describe Rumi at the moment to anybody that's completely new, new to the space? Yeah, so I would say that uh, on the one hand, we help farmers implement sustainable grazing. And on the other hand, we're going to create a proof for them that they have done so and uh, which, with which they can get financing to finance this basic transition towards sustainable farming. Yeah, so the... So it's really the double, the double piece. Exactly. And implementing sustainable grazing or holistic grazing or better grazing. Um, we're going to unpack why that's so important, but also like that's been do, going on for quite a while, mainly through trainers, through, uh, sessions, yeah. through, um, a lot of, but a lot of one to one or one to a few. Mm -hmm. And, and I think we can all agree that that needs to go faster. Like yeah. what's the role of technology there to unlock it? But is it also possible? And I think you're showing that to do that faster and it's not necessary to have 
somebody like as a coach like on the ground to follow your every step as a as a farmer to go through the process like how are you unlocking that to to go faster than than it currently is because it is spreading people are changing their grazing practices it's just way too slow to have the impact we need to have so so during the interviews we found that uh, a lot of farmers they went to um for example to gabe brown's farm right to learn okay what is what is he doing and how can i just do it on my farm so some were even paid to do that by like supermarket chains um and then they they tried it themselves on their farm and couldn't make it happen even um after maybe they tried to get the help from a from a consultant um they yeah like unforeseen things different soil types different grass types it uh um, you know, can, can really have a massive impact on your on your journey. Um, so we we think that this kind of um, having a good consultant who understands uh, basically the science uh, behind sustainable farming and how you can actually make it happen and then help you implement it. Um, that that's very important. So we found that in our first investor, who is a, a grazing consultant in the UK, who basically like helped us also understand what is the actual mechanism behind it, right? Um, and so get, getting away from, uh, like a, a, like a text or like a, let's call it, a, like a rule book or like, a, a gospels or whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, if you only do this, you'll exactly, be saying, yeah, yeah. It's like where you have to follow this, this is exactly what you need to do and it's going to work to, okay, so I understand those are your exact characteristics on your farms. This is what you've been trying and it didn't work. Which is what we want to do children to do as well. Like it's not if you want them exactly to, okay, if you do this, this, and this, and this, then this answer come out, comes out of your mathematical model. But if that answer doesn't come, it would be nice if you actually understand them all. Yeah. Like what are the, yeah, the mechanisms behind growing grass and growing healthy grass and keep like optimal and, and, but without going through 10 years of, of education and study to understand that because that just, we don't have yeah, the time. Or trial and error. Right? So what did he see yeah. in that? Like what, what did he, what did he see in that to join you? Because I could also see quote unquote as a threat yes. because he probably has enough work for the next 50 years. Doesn't have to worry about that because this, these really good consultants are full until 2020, 2030 basically. Yeah. And yet there was an interest. Okay. How can I leverage technology and how can I sort of augment myself or repeat, like sort of clone myself as a, as a consultant and work with many more people without working with way more people. Right? Yeah, but that's exactly the ambition, right? So he felt like, okay, I, I want to scale myself faster. This, this has to happen faster, this process, uh, the same urgency around climate change uh, and farmers in, in uh, peril, right? Uh, and he felt like, okay, I, I can actually scale myself through this application, right? So we're basically, so his name is James Daniel. So we, in the beginning, we were just joking, okay, we're going to build James Daniel as an app, essentially, right? Uh, and, uh, so <laughs> at least the, the stuff that we, that he shows up at a hologram on your, <laughs> on your land. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, um, yeah, the, maybe not quite that far, but yes, like basically getting all his knowledge, uh, in, um, and, and also for, like just him teaching us, um, and then, uh, recording uh, or like giving webinars, uh, recording different content, um, that, that we can also then, yeah, share with farmers basically. Right. And, and kind of systematically breaking down what, what works and, uh, why it works um, so that we can understand it and we can fill it into the app right and we can also explain it to farmers in, in a in a good way and so how does that work and and actually let's start with it does it limit you now like we have a lot of this i, I don't know uh, james but we have a lot of the, the gurus in the space that are quite like it has to be like that and not like that it need we need to like does it limit you working with one person sort of recreating him in the app <laughs> um between brackets obviously or are these relatively um let's say general rules about grazing and and like you can start implementing other philosophies about grazing in other areas yeah. or like how does it limit you or actually it, it doesn't and it's a quite a mm -hmm. it, let's say he's not the guru <laughs> that's going to be offended if you change certain yeah. things about uh, <laughs> him in the so, so i don't think he would consider himself a guru i think he so he has a, a bachelor in uh, uh, engineering um so he's like more of a scientist as well like from from the way he approaches things, right? So so that that works for us, um, so that we don't have to say, okay, you need to do mob grazing, otherwise you can't be part of the program, or you need to do holistic grazing. That's the thing, right? So we can actually just talk to farmers uh, where they are now, figure out why are, are you where you are? Are you like what is your willingness to change? Uh, what is your what is the possibility to change on your farm? And then figure out how do we get from where you are today to something ideally zero input farm. 
uh, and and how fast can we achieve that? Right, like so basically because just to be clear, like many many grazing operations, uh, we we maybe if you're not running a grazing operation, you don't know, but you use an immense amount of inputs um, for like to to keep the grass, the monoculture grass growing. Like just to give an, to give an idea to us, the listeners, if you work on a typical farm of one of your farmers you work with, what would we see, and how much input goes into that? Like how many cows are there? How how would we see the current situation before they go into any kind of transition? I know they're all different, but just a, a general and try to make it visual because we're obviously, <laughs> yeah. uh, you're between our ears. So okay, keep, yeah. bring us on a journey. Um, so like, so the ideal farmer for us is the one who, who does everything in the worst possible way, right? Which I'll describe now. Uh, so he is ideally set stock raising, meaning he's not rotating animals at all between fields or maybe only once or twice a year, right? So for, for our climate here, that's very little. Um, right. And that means the, there's a lot of compaction happening in the soil, right? The animals are constantly on it. Um, more compaction means less water in the soil, right? It's like a sponge. You can imagine if you compress a sponge, there's no water that can go in, right? If you, if the sponge is uh, expanded, it can soak up a lot and it, it stays like uh, available to the plants. Um, yeah. And then you. So this summer is, 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 is an issue if you have compacted soil. I think everybody in Europe is suffering from drought and, and too much rain at the worst moment and nothing is getting so dead. So it's very, and, and the grass, how does it look like? Do you see a lot of, is, is it like a very nice, well, like it, from an outsider, does the grass look okay? Or is it like with a lot of, uh, um, let's say uncovered ground and bare soil in between? Like yeah. what's the worst situation? Yeah, exactly that what I just described. Like the, the grass is no longer green, right? The, um, it's super dry. Like we've seen actually pictures uh, on a side note from farmers where leaves are falling from the trees as if it's autumn already just because of this insane dryness. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, exactly. So if, if you do set stock grazing, you're basically going to have a lot of bare soil. All the grass is uh, yeah, super dry. You're not growing anything, right? And and your your animals are going to try to eat the last stops of the completely dried grass, right? And that, that's that's even going to ruin your your uh, grass sward for, for years probably. Right, uh, or like for a long time, it's not going to recover on its own very easily. Um, then you're probably going to use a, a monoculture perennial ryegrass, um, meaning very relatively shallow roots. But if you give it enough nitrogen, it's going to grow quite fast, right? And that's why you have use a lot of fertilizer, right, to to make this grass grow, right? But if you have no no water, obviously it's, it's not going to grow anyway. Um, so that's why it's a problem. Um, and then the fertilizer is ve- nitrogen is very expensive. Yes, so that too. Yeah, so that's that's another incentive actually for farmers right now to change, which which is great. Mm, yeah, so we see farmers who use fifty to hundred kilos per hectare, right? Um, in in nitrogen fertilizer, which is a lot. Um, yeah, and then yeah, so talk basically monoculture, set stock grazing, so bad management, and uh, yeah, no no biodiversity, right? S- single single grass and that that's what we change right so we say okay based on your soil type and some willingness to change I mean, yeah that would be there, yes, right. Right. the farmer needs to at least have have an, Im- an image or an imagination of what could be possible maybe has seen other farms maybe have been to mm-hmm. cape brown maybe has tested something but there must be i mean they must pick up the phone and call you otherwise or or pick up the phone and download the app yes um but they, there must be some step because otherwise mm-hmm. so they let's say this farmer calls you what what happens then Yes. So we would uh, first try to understand, okay, where, how big is your farm? How much grassland do you have? How many animals do you have? What is your stocking rate? Um, what is, what type of grasses do you have? You know, like all the characteristics that I just described. What has been your historic management? What are you planning to do? You know, how do your finances look like? Everything needs to be uh, taken into consideration in our viewpoint. Uh, like a farmer, um, like who, who only has beef or only dairy cattle, right? He's really going to care a lot about uh, like, you know, where the inputs come from, how expensive they are and how productive they can be. So you cannot, um, look at those things in isolation, right? If, if you're, if you have the luxury, let's say, to have enough money to just play around with animals, right? And to say, okay, this year I'm going to have 10, maybe next year I'm going to have 30, depending on, you know, how I feel about it. But actually your, your main operation is somewhere completely different, then it doesn't matter so much, right? But if, if this is your only way of making income, then, uh, this, the, you need to look at the, the animals, the grass, and the business at the same time. Um, yeah. Um, so kind of lost my thread here. What then, we're talking then, about? No, and then and then what happens? No, so the, you you get this full picture of the financial situation, of the farm situation, 
and and then um then you're you're I was, I'm going to say Google anymore. Yeah. Then, then, like, what happens okay, then? Yes, like, how do we right, come yeah. up with a, a transition plan? Yeah, exactly. Yes. And and then, of course, the finance piece of it. But we get to the finance. Like, then, okay, you you use this amount every year of input. This costs this at the moment. How do we get you off this quote unquote drug as fast as possible? But of course, it means changing the the practices quite a bit. Like, what would you? And but not making it too risky because then, as a farmer, I would say, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to risk yeah. this because. I've seen others that tried and failed, or maybe I tried it myself and failed as well. Like, how do I get over that very, very rightfully so, very scary bump of, okay, I'm going to quite completely <laughs> throw my organization or my, my, my life around this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So after we have all this data, we create a transition plan, right, where we figure out what can be done without jeopardizing operations, uh, how fast can it be done, how many, and then also how many carbon credits would that be, right? Uh, and how much revenue could you get from that and what could they finance, right? So that we can say, this is your business case. You don't see, but Johannes is doing a very nice movement of bringing back things. <laughs> so finance is great because it, it brings things backwards, yes. basically, or forward to us now. Like you can get some finance now to put solar panels or to change practices and they pay over a year, over mm -hmm. time. And if you can get that finance, it moves to you, but he makes a very nice <laughs> movement towards himself. Like how do we bring this back in time, the, the, the potential benefits or the benefits that come over time? And that's, that's, that's the click there. You can finance these things. So that's what you discovered. And that's what you're building through carbon, which mainly come, I think, from the fertilizer reduce, uh, reduce fertilizer and the soil carbon. I think those two are the ones that, that work together there. Or is it separate or, or how, let's say, how difficult is it to make that transition plan? Is it very relatively standard or is it super, super, super specific? Like on where people are, like, do you need somebody on site to really build that or have you figured out okay if you do these 10 things if you take these variables into account you can get to a pretty you get you can get to 80 percent. let's say yeah yeah that's what you said at the end now basically is like so we did around maybe 100 of those transition plans now right and we've seen a lot of different types of cases edge cases uh, but also we, we can start grouping um farmers into different uh kind of um yeah groups i guess cohorts, cohorts yes yeah um, yeah. so, so now, like for 90% of the cases, we, we can be pretty quick at saying, okay, this is what's possible, right? Um, so for example, let's say you have 100 hectares, right? And then the question is, okay, how do I get from monoculture ryegrass to completely perfect, diverse, uh, you know, grass sward Pasture, with uh, nitrogen amazing. fixing species yeah, and yeah. everything in there, right? So I don't need fertilizer anymore. Right. So you, you can't just, if you want to have an operations, you can't do the whole thing at once. It's not possible. Right. So you need to think about, okay, do I do 5%, 10% or 15% of my grazing platform per year? Right. What is, what can I actually sustain? Um, and, and that's what we can essentially just calculate, right. Based on, uh, productivity and how the grass has been managed before. Right. So if it was set stock grazing before and used this much fertilizer, then we can say, okay, there's actually you have whatever 30% room in improving your management practices and grass utilization. That means we can actually produce this much more food from, from forage and that you, that's uh, available to your animals. Um, with, uh, and that means we can reduce, for example, the, the total platform by 30% during the, during a year without uh, risking any uh, reduction in productivity. Yeah. And, and does these crazy droughts like, model into that like do you take into the consideration the crazy climate we currently live in or how does that work or everybody suffers obviously um but maybe if you're in transition you suffer more or or, or less like how, how how have you seen that this year in 2022 yeah yeah so you you might suffer more actually which is really bad and that's one of the reasons why some farmers give up um which is why so what what we want farmers to do is we we want them to follow the plan as um closely as they can but obviously we want to have a conversation with them as well okay if you didn't follow the plan what what happened um and uh, we will be lenient when it's things like this drought right but we can see actually the farmer did reseed as we said he did reduce fertilizer he just couldn't do the rotations as planned because um it, it was just too dry he had to graze not to, uh you know, he, he couldn't leave, let's say, 15 centimeters of grass. He had to graze down to five. It just wasn't possible otherwise, um, as, as one example, right? So, and then at the end of the year, they will always get uh, the, the payments um, through the carbon credits. Yeah. And as you say, we can see, we get to the payments. Everybody who's listening on the finance piece, we get there. 
But like, when does the, we say we can see, does it mean, is this the piece where the satellite comes in? Um, how does that help you? Because we haven't really covered that until, until now. Like what is possible now with satellite and, and grass? Like what, I don't think you can count the different grasses, but I mean, I know you can count trees from space, but you can't really see what happens underneath. Like how, um, why is this possible now? And, and as described for people, I will put a, a remote sensing episode we did um, with Ish and Tom as well in, in, the, in the show notes. But why is this possible now that it wasn't possible, let's say, five or 10 years ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so we're using two different types of uh, satellite imagery. One is uh, multispectral, where, which is really good at uh, detecting uh, biomass above ground um, and the variation of... Which is great for you to figure out. Yeah. yeah. Grass, yeah, like and see, exactly. okay, is, is something changing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it gives you also some indication of, of moisture. Uh, so like it, it can, you can figure from it, you can figure out what is the, the dry part of the biomass, right? Which is essentially what you need as a farmer to know, okay, how much can I feed my animals every day? They, they typically know, um, okay, I need 2% of my animal's body weight in a dry matter every day. Um, yeah. So from, from that we get the variation, but the, the resolution is only 10 by 10 meters, right? So that, that sounds a bit crazy, but on a, on a massive, uh, grassland, right? It, it doesn't really matter so much. And we can do some machine learning trickery to, to increase the resolution a little bit. Um, called, yeah, something called super resolution for those who are interested. Um, yeah. And then we combine that with, um, radar satellite imagery, right? So the, the problem with the multispectral data is that it's, it's an optical sensor, right? It's whenever you have clouds or anything in between, it's, it's going to be, it can't go see anything. That never happens in the UK. No, yeah, there's almost no clouds in the UK. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's why we need the, the radar uh, imagery, which can penetrate clouds. Um, and it's more accurate for seeing height differences, right? You, you still can't get to a centimeter resolution, but you can, for example, see, okay, I went down from half a meter to 15, right? So, so the, those drops you can see. You wouldn't be able to see the the variation of the bioma biomass as... I mean, I went down, meaning it, it's been grazed. Yes, exactly. Literally that. Wow. Yeah. Um, so we can see what, what has this field been grazed or not, right? Um, and we can... And the radar can be, can work every day. Yes. Like that's, uh -huh. that's one that, that doesn't care about clouds, Correct. doesn't care about yeah. anything. Just I mean, yeah, you, have, yeah. you have other types of interferences and it's not super easy data to work with. But if you combine it together with um, this multispectral imagery um, and because we have a lot of uh, measurement data from farmers about uh, grass heights historically and uh, current as well, that we can basically, we, we built this model just for this purpose, right? To, to figure out how much machine. grass you currently yeah. have. Yeah. And then now we can do things like um, we, we have an internal grass growth model based on like temperature and what we see on multispectral and so on. So cool. Right. Yeah. And then if we internal grass yeah. growth model, yeah, we have an internal grass. <laughs> course model what, what do you model i, I model grass it's, yeah. it's uh that's what, what we do <laughs> it's it's really important but it's i mean it's it's the foundation of, of a big chunk of our life it's very interesting that that we don't discuss that more often like or, or tree tree growth models like it's very interesting like how do you turn sunlight into something quote-unquote useful is is everything we do that's the whole point and and yet we're laughing when you say a grass growth model because we don't discuss it very often. So it's something we, we should do way yeah, more. Yeah, I agree. And uh, like what happens above ground gives you a good indication of what happens below, right? Uh, so for, for example, with this growth model, we can say, okay, your grass should grow this much every day currently. But then suddenly we see that your grass grows way faster. So that means we can actually say, you put fertilizer on there and we know pretty much how much nitrogen it was as well. Right. So then we can say, okay, that, that impacted your, your soil negatively as well. Right. And it uh, obviously created emissions from fertilizer itself, uh, from the fuel you use in your tractor to spray the fertilizer and so on. Right. So that's, that's where this uh, kind of where the, uh, the grazing management or the farm management data uh, goes into carbon credit verification. Right. So we can, this, uh, our, our view is like you, you, if you want to do very high quality verification, you need to know about what the farmer is doing at any point in time, right? Because uh, if, if you want to do it in a way that's scalable, right? Uh, we talked earlier about like all the different emissions that go into uh, like these carbon credits, right? So one is solar organic carbon, it's like 80, 90%, but then it's the um, methane emissions from enteric fermentation. It's the, you know, from, from the fertilizer, the emissions from the manure, how you store it and for how long. Like if you have an open slurry pit, right? Uh, 
the, these gases that go into the into the air that like if, if you go to a village you know that but when it smells like that that yeah, can't be yeah. healthy and and it really isn't right you uh, whenever an animal so you take all of that into yeah. account and and look at the net improvement exactly you yeah. take into consideration okay we know that this farmer uh, sprayed uh, npk x amount of time with this amount so we, we know more or less what that is we know the diesel we know how he or she stored um the manure if he or she had that we know the soil carrying carbon part and then we do the calculation and we we come out hopefully with a plus and that's exactly. uh, able to that we're able to sell that and and finance with that and then we, i make the movement again yeah. going back, we finance the the transition with that which i think is very interesting because normally um we but let, let's unpack that a bit so and how because but many people say i mean we, we come back to the the it's the cow not the how like what do you see in those numbers from a very bad case like the worst case you could see but still a farmer willing to change like how meaningful are these is the carbon potential there like do you see are they significant enough to to of course otherwise they wouldn't be working with you but are these significant enough to uh, but maybe they only work for the savings of uh, of the fertilizer which is also okay but are these significant enough to make people move like what do you see there in terms of potential let's say on that 100 acre farm or an average one you work with from a business perspective or from a carbon perspective yeah just if if now if somebody has been using the worst practices and going through mm -hmm. this transition with you, like how much are we saving? Okay. How much are we storing? Yeah. Uh, how much okay. uh, on yeah. average, more or less, are, are you able yeah. to verify because you're able to check yeah. if somebody put yeah. the, the carbon or the, the NPK mm -hmm. there because you have the yeah. set. Yeah. Um, so like, let's say we're talking a, a dairy farmer in, in Europe, they might have something like um, eight tons of uh, CO2 equivalent in emissions per hectare per year. Right. Uh, during the transition period, the kind of the, the uh, increase in solid organic carbon is going to ramp up as you have more and more species uh, on um, on more and more of your grazing platform, right? And you're going to be able to reduce your fertilizer emissions more and more as well, also gradually, right? So at the end of five... So, so it's a double yes, one. Yes, exactly. It stores and you reduce, exactly, which yeah. is great. Yeah. Um, so at, at, a, at the five-year point um, until 10 years after we started, that's where you're going to have the, the biggest uh, drawdown, right? And the biggest uh, reduction kind of... And, um, so there we can be around zero, right? So we're going from eight to zero, uh, based on what's possible with increasing solid organic carbon and reduction fertilizer. Then afterwards, it kind of depends on where your initial, uh, solid organic carbon was, um, and where you're basically going to find your equilibrium. Um, and, uh, we, because like over time, you're going to reduce the amount of uh, increase per, per hectare per year, right? Uh, so, but even afterwards, you can find farms that can be carbon neutral for a decade or two, right? And then maybe they will end up, uh, if you take enteric fermentation into consideration at around maybe two, three um, tons of CO2 equivalent per hectare per year, right? If you keep the stocking rate the same, um, right? So animals per hectare, um, that's the assumption right now, right? So if you were to reduce your animals, of course, then, you know, you, that's a completely different story. Which we think is yeah, or yeah. I mean, and, and the methane equivalent, or the, the the that's a very big discussion if we should include that or not, and how methane works. Yeah. Um, but if you look only at carbon, you, you're going to be carbon negative if you take the um, the methane out of the equation. Yes. Yeah. So if you case. only want to take carbon, right? Then we only take the fuel um, and the um, yeah, and the increase in solid organic carbon into account, right? So the fertilizers typically, you know, nitrous oxide and um, other, other stuff yeah and so when you sell these credits is it you mostly sell reduction ones because you reduce so much the input side or you sell so it's sort of a combination yeah. of and, and does it make that complicated yeah so it's a combination of removal and avoidance right um which does make it sometimes complicated to, for some buyers but um we're, we're trying to also like help um, shape that conversation because in, in our view Right. So the nature based solution, you need both. What, yeah. what you call it in, in the carbon yeah. market, right? Is, is the only thing that's available right now, which we can scale, right? There, there's a lot of, uh, like technology that, that's still in the kind of its infancy and we need to scale it up to, to get to something meaningful. But today we can make these changes right away, right? And discussing, okay, should we have fewer animals or not? It should be different, right? Like that, uh, there is, um, like if, if let's say we, we were to reduce our livestock today, right? That means like on some project area, let's say in the UK, we reduce uh, all livestock by 50%, then okay, what's gonna happen? It's not like people will eat less meat 
all of a sudden. It means someone else or some other country will actually pick that up and will just increase uh, the number of animals. So you have this kind of leakage problem, which means you, you actually probably want to kind of maintain the uh, livestock numbers. Um, in some areas, they should probably be reduced, right? So if, if your own land cannot maintain the number of animals that you have, you should probably not have that many animals. But we need to figure out how, where do we displace it then? The carrying capacity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Where, yeah. where, how do we account for this kind of leakage problem? And, and uh, how do we make up for the loss in, in proteins as well? Right. Um, and how have you seen that from some, some of these farmers? Because we've heard stories, people are like increasing the stocking rate and the carrying capacity dramatically by changing their management while yeah. reducing or going to zero with input, which is a very interesting, which suggests that you're taking more sunlight and transforming it to something very, very useful, which is nutrient dense protein, etc. Like, have you seen that as well in the UK or is it mostly like say American stories and other stories where we actually what we could do on this piece of land is much more than we could imagine until we tried. And then we saw actually we could produce way more grass and thus support way more animals than we, we thought before. Yeah, yeah. so we do ha also have these uh, kind of uh, understocked and overgrazed uh, farms. Absolutely. Like we see that a lot. Um, and Which is just to get it in your head, like everybody listening, like understocked and overgrazed is a crazy phenomenon. I think the first time I, I heard somebody probably listening, young Gisbert, uh, said it like most farms are understocked and overgrazed. It sounds crazy. Um, but I think Gabe Brown has said it and, and some of the savory people, obviously, as well. So, which suggests that we're damaging our farm and getting way less animal protein of it than we could, plus having a lot of input and all the other yeah. externalities that we don't have. So, which is sort of a wicked, like, why? So, they, they exist. Many of them are understocked and overgrazed. Absolutely. That's yeah. Part. And uh, so, it's, Mariko said that in a previous episode as well, right? So, like, reducing inputs, that's, that's the main thing. I think she was talking about it shouldn't just be, no, yeah, it shouldn't just be CO2, but I think that's a different topic, sorry. So, like, <laughs> yeah, the chemical side as well. Yeah. I mean, that's a whole different one as well, the chemical input yeah. side. But the, the whole input industry, yeah, we were completely addicted to to the trucks coming on our farm, dropping a lot of different things that, that sort of, and then we're still understocked and overgrazed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so on the carbon piece, on the discredit piece, you've been selling the first ones. How has it been going? Like how difficult, quote unquote, is it to, to have this story? It's not the cow, it's the how. <laughs> Because I'm imagining many of these companies that are buying from you are in big cities, very far removed from uh, the farms itself, just like you were, um, but maybe even further because they weren't didn't grow up on a farm. Like, how difficult is it to sell, quote unquote, this story of uh, you actually should invest in in, in ruminant transition if you want to have a meaningful uh, dent in the next couple yeah. of years? So, so one thing that's difficult is to explain um, how important the increase in soil organic carbon is because it's not something you can just see directly, like a tree. Right. Um, so that, that's a kind of a difficulty for us. Uh, what is easier for us is that actually the, 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 the project sites where these companies can invest in essentially to, uh, for, with their offsets, they are typically way closer to, to the headquarter than a project that's maybe halfway around the world. Right. So that, that's a actually a big plus. Yeah. So like, you know, imagine as, as an, if you're a company and you want to, um, attract new employees and you want to tell the story that you are, uh, and, and, or make it part of your brand that you care about sustainability. But then you also want to tell in, like, you want to be able to show that, that what you're doing is meaningful, right? And that it's uh, actually happening. Um, and, and what we are able to do because we talk or we, we are so close to farmers is we can actually, um, tell much or help do much better storytelling, right? And, and it's much more relatable to say, Hey, uh, I'm actually supporting this farmer that's, 10 kilometers away from, from where, where I work, rather than maybe there's going to be some trees in Bolivia, right? It's, yeah, uh, no, it's, it's, it's very close. And then, so you, what, what is the, the, the I would, not the trick, but what's the mechanism here? You calculate with the farmer what is possible in five and 10 years. And then it's not that you promise him or her, okay, in 10 years, we're going to pay you. So no, let's bring that forward now. So you can actually make these transitions. Like how difficult is that? Because it means you're sort of pre-financing these uh, carbon gains that or carbon uh, like avoided emissions and stored emissions that didn't really happen. Yeah, yet. exactly. Yeah. So that uh, we, we basically also pre-sell these credits, right? So that means uh, we, even though we only verify the emission reductions after they have happened, right? So we can still convince buyers. Uh, of these carbon credits that we will make them happen, 
uh, right? Um, and, and so that, that, that seems to work quite well because like we can show that from our track record of selling credits, right? We're, we're selling them at twice the price of our closest uh, competitor in, in the kind of livestock space. Um, and we, we haven't been having trouble, let's say, fi finding buyers, right? Uh, which is really great because it means that there's, uh, people willing to invest into farmers, right? Uh, to, to change their practices voluntarily, which, which I think is fantastic, right? So the, it just shows that the, we, we like the, may, maybe, the, the kind of uh, uh, zeitgeist is changing that we want to get closer to, to, to where the food comes from, right? We actually want to support one another. Um, and I think that's fantastic. And, and the companies you, you sell to, are they typically in the food space? Are they in media? Like what, what are, because um, you said you want to get closer. Is that literally like they are in the food space? They're interested because of that? Or they are generally, let's say, very conscious companies that, that want to voluntarily obviously offset or inset and actually offset if they're not in the food space like what do you see as a typical uh, like why do they come to you yeah so it's uh, kind of ge geographical closeness that's what we see at least for carbon credits right um, and here we mm -hmm. speak of the uh, offset so location location yes, location. Exactly. <laughs> and it's uh, and story 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 right uh, you need to be able to tell a good story um it's it's part of the of the marketing uh, strategy right it's uh, oftentimes of course they care one one thinks right but at the same time it's part of the marketing and pr um so that's but that's on the offsetting side right so like uh where an, anyone technically could buy these offsets anywhere on the planet any uh any kind of company any any industry right um even though we want to make sure that it's only companies who also can show either already a track record or have uh, some believable strategy for reducing their own emissions right um but then you also have the second kind of uh, distribution channel, if you will, which is within the food supply chain, right? And there you typically speak of insetting, right? Because it uh, stays within the supply chain. The, these carbon credits stay, yeah, in the supply chain. Um, and there, um, yeah, we we see equally good traction, right? So we, we are using the same type of pricing um, as for the voluntary carbon market. And companies want to reduce their own emissions, right? Typically, they have goals for, okay, I want to, reduce my emissions by 50% by 2030, right? And oftentimes, a lot of these emissions come from how the raw materials are produced or the, the inputs are produced, right? And that then comes down to the farmers. That means we well, need to reduce emissions for the farmers, but they don't know how, right? So that means they actually pay us to onboard farmers and help them go through the transition plan, right? And here again, um, the, it, it works with the financing, right? Because and they will be interested in, in buying these these raw materials. In this case, animal protein, which is much more traceable. Of course, you you have all the traceability, and and has a really really good story coming back to exactly, the story. Yeah. Piece. And and they can inset part of their their emissions they get down the mm -hmm. line. Yeah, and I would even say so. Today, you actually see a lot of uh, like dairy or or beef companies in, in the supply chain who want to. And maybe already are paying for uh, sustainable products, but they don't actually know whether anything is happening with that money that they're paying, this premium that they're paying, right? Maybe they paid one of these farmers to go to Gabe Brown's farm and, <laughs> exactly. and then never had nothing happened. Or they paid these trainings, which are great, but then if they don't follow up with a concrete transition plan and all the work after and the verification, it's very, I mean, we all know that we go to amazing courses, et cetera, and then on Monday morning, you show up again at work or in your farm and then, yeah, to implement it is very, very exactly. difficult. And you sort of give them a tool to follow through for at least a group that wants to and, and wants to potentially get premiums as well. Because I think not only reducing drastically your input, of course, get paid for the transition, which is great. But also if the supermarket chain or whatever can say, okay, but if you reach this in this uh, level, we, we have a certain premium ready for you, which, which drives the yeah, market. Exactly. And you see that happening already, like that those forces are starting to pull and, and push. Basically. Absolutely. Yeah. What we also see is that some companies, they try to also implement it by having pilot pro programs, right? So with maybe a handful, sometimes 30 farmers, right? But they're really asking themselves, how, how are we going to do this for thousands, right? How Because if you want to reduce your overall emissions by 50%, it's not enough if you do it with 30 farmers. You need to do it with all of them. Yeah. Uh, and... So what would you say now in, in this space of, of a carbon hype and, and a lot of attention, droughts, et cetera, what would you say? Let's, uh, I always ask this question in this, let's imagine we're in a theater. Let's imagine we do this uh, in person soon. And we have a lot of smart investors in the room 
uh, investing their own money, investing other people's money, et cetera. What would you, obviously without giving investment advice, but what would you tell them to do once they leave? Like, okay, what would be the first step? Is that doing long interviews with farmers, like you said, like going deep into the space? Or what are spaces or places that you say, okay, they really deserve more attention and more interest, more resources, more energy, and potentially more money as well? Um, I think if we look at the carbon market, there's um, a lot of investments basically going uh, to downstream innovations like marketplaces, brokers, rating agencies, whatever. But there's very little on the supply side, right? On the actual supply, like, you know, you're actually creating the credits that uh, need to be then sold, rated, whatever. Uh, so I think in investing and figuring out how to best invest in, into a uh, credible supply, that that's very important. Um, and... Uh, I think um, looking at kind of hands-off approaches is very difficult, or like is, uh, I don't I don't see that that's that can be successful based on how we talk to farmers. Like saying, for example, you only provide financing and you don't even talk to the farmer necessarily. You're basically a bank uh, where you're saying, okay, I'm going to help you get money because some people want to pay money for regenerative grazing, but then you know you just they do some credibility check as, as, as bank, so to speak, but you don't actually then figure out, okay, what is the farmer going to do? Because the risk is going to stay with the farmer. He has to figure out how am I actually going to do that? How am I going to generate, let's say, these many credits? Or how am I going to actually make these emission reductions happen? Or how uh, am I going to run a business, uh, you know, with these different practices? How am I actually going to transition? Uh, so I think that that's why these hands-off approaches, in my opinion, are very difficult. So I would look for uh, companies maybe who... Uh, can show that they can either attract a large enough segment of, of a very particular type of farmer or who, who can show that they have been able to, to, to speak to or attract a lot of different types of farmers, right? So where you can just, okay, they, they understand farming, right? They understand, um, like farmers want to work with them and they, they actually understand how to generate the supply, right? That, that's the, yeah, what, what I would say. And, and so what would you do if you would be in charge of a, of a billion dollar or a billion euros, let's keep it, or a billion pounds sterling as you're in the UK? Uh, what would you do if you had to invest that? You had to put it to work um, with a very long lifetime if you want to, or very short, maybe say most impact can be made now. Would you just buy all these credits? Would you set up a lot of roomies around the world or would you shoot some more satellites into space because you need better than 10 meter uh, accuracy or would you just spend it all on uh, or invest it all in machine learning like what would you or maybe consumer awareness around these things yeah. like what would you do if you had to put that to work yeah um i think more satellites would definitely be good and making it available and making it cheap uh, and also easy to use i think are helps. they getting there like is this 10 meter or something like if we would discuss this in a year it would be to eight or five like is this a continuing uh, progress uh like you, you, it's getting better over time or is the machine learning and like the software getting better to to identify 10 meters and, and let's say up upscale it to like is that is it a continuous improvement like like Moore's law or what's it happening is, yeah, it's happening on, on both sides just like with computers and and you know software like the software is getting better and the hardware is getting better so it's the same thing for satellites right so you have more and more satellites being shot in the in, uh, in orbit um and the prices are getting cheaper and cheaper like so what we're using free um satellite imagery from from the european space agency but uh, so, so we, which have this relatively coarse resolution, right? But the, also there, you know, the technology is moving on, not in kind of months, but, you know, more like decades, but it's happening, right? Yeah, and yeah. at the same time, image processing um, algorithms and so on are, are getting better, right? Um, and, and compute power. So you cheaper. would maybe spend it, you might maybe put it uh, a bit into the satellite space, mm -hmm. but what, what else would you do? Um, so we have to like, ex you mean except for Rumi, right? Um, but, uh, <laughs> so I, you can, you can, you can put it like 50, 50 million into Rumi if you want to, but there, I'm curious about yeah, the rest. Uh, and it, but it should it stay in the kind of in, in the food space? Cause I, I was thinking, um, like could be yeah. anything. No, really. I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I'm asking this question because I'm curious how people working in the space would prioritize if they had sort of unlimited resources. Yeah. So, so what I think is like, even though we haven't solved the climate crisis and solved um, food production or anything like this, it, it feels to me at least, okay, we can actually solve this within the next 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. I don't know. It's, it's at least, uh, it feels like it's on the horizon and we know how to do it. We, we, we just need to execute in quotation marks. Uh, and I feel like there's some questions that we haven't uh, solved yet. Um, one is there's going to be a, a lot of migration that has to happen 
because of climate change. I don't know how we're going to solve that. Uh, you know, like we, we've seen what happened in uh, whatever ten years ago when th there was migration happening after after you know was a Syrian war. Or I can't remember, right? But you know, refugees coming to Europe that was a big crisis, um, and it's just going to be ten hundred times bigger within the next twenty years. How how are we going to solve that? I like that. That's a big question for me. And another one is uh, how. Are we going to solve um, the the issue around uh, uh, like basically what the, the consequences of an aging society, right? Like, um, I think that that's going to really put us in front of a lot of problems. Like how we actually finance that, um, how we make sure that uh, older people don't live in poverty, um, and like you know, with more like you, with age, you have a higher risk for health issues. Right, dementia, like mental ones, like dementia, whatever. Um, so, like that, that's just going to require a rethink in, in how we set up society, right? So, right now, you have typically young people living in cities, working on tech, and then old people like, moving. I was going to say this gets into a into a whole different topic, yeah. which we should get into. Not this one. <laughs> yeah, that's why I was like rural, rural urban divide, exactly. and, and how we and, shape. And generational but divide. But I think what's interesting here, a generational divide, and of course with migrants as well like how do we how do we shape uh, uh the, the the countryside or actually the country we want to and and but i think there's a very interesting connection with the way we farm yeah and and the way we we manage the land let's bring it broader and the reason i'm, I'm recording these interviews is because i think regenerative practices and region ag and food is a very nice entry point to ask all of those questions as well because you're forced to after a while to ask questions about land ownership to ask questions about why Southern, Southern people were very lucky in life and, and got a hundred hectares and many others, most people didn't and, and were born somewhere else. And many people got access to water or didn't. And many people got access to education or didn't. Many people got access to a lot of money or didn't. Yeah. And, and there are big questions around health and, and big questions around yeah. uh, intergenerational living, big questions around living in general, like what we want houses to be or transport. We come back to the, uh, the, the flying, no, sorry, the self-driving houses. <laughs> I think it, it, it forces us to ask all of yeah. those questions. Do we want to be dependent on massive input companies that get stuff somewhere that we don't even know? Or do we want to be like, how do we shape that? And, and it forces us to ask those questions. It's very valid. But as we're almost approaching the hour, I would also say, let's keep that for another one. But as we sit down, I think this is a good one to do in person. Honestly, yeah. it's better than do through video as, as we do now. So if you, had a magic wand. I think it's a, it's a good final question in this case, because it nicely connects to what you uh, would invest in as well. Like, what would you change? If you had one thing you could change overnight, what would you use that for? And, and it's a very powerful tool, obviously, but what would you do? I think having uh, the, the perfect food labels um, is, is what I would change. Like where, uh, as a consumer, you can actually make informed choices about what you're buying. Um, that, that would be fantastic. Like, you know, like today you have a, a jungle of different labels and I, I haven't at least seen one yet where you can actually just look at it and say, that's great. I can make a decision based on that uh, on, and, and on that alone. Because uh, I think it's it's a very complex issue, right? And we tend to oversimplify. Um, and uh, that's why companies who produce food can take advantage of that. Uh, so as, as one example, like, you know, you wouldn't, uh, you, you don't know whether a monoculture oat field that you use to produce a milk alternative is actually better for the climate than cow milk that you can buy. Like it's uh, like you, you can't make that choice right now as a consumer, right? Uh, or if you if you eat avocados or lime from from Mexico, right? Are, are you aware that you're probably supporting drug cartels, right? And I think that's a terrible state to be in as a consumer. Even you you try to make a good choice, but if but even if you try it, you you cannot make the right choice. And I think that's terrible. Yeah, so having the perfect food label, I think, uh, would... Would be a very busy one, I yeah. think. But it also has to be simple and, and understandable. Yeah. And it would be very interesting to... That, that level of transparency. Um, would you think... Do you think people would care? Then enough, enough people would care. Now, let me rephrase the question. To, to leave this peanut butter and take another one or to take this avocado and, and like to make that choice in a supermarket or in a place where they buy... I think so, yes. Where we buy, honestly. Yeah. Do we care? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I, I, if you look at like whatever organic produce, for example, right, then you see, okay, people are buying that. 
you see people choosing to be vegetarian or vegan because of uh, climate. So I think there's the willingness uh, to, to change. And then I think there's a big group of people who are saying, I can't make a reasonable choice, so I'll just buy whatever. I'll just buy the cheapest, right? So then I think the, the, there's a majority of people who would uh, make a, a choice based on that label and actually change the way we produce food. Because a farmer is going to produce what he can sell, right? Uh, so I think it has to start uh, at, at the consumer level, which is obviously then the perception is shaped by uh, marketing from companies, right? So, but those things maybe need to work in, in, in unison. I think that uh, food producing companies have understood that sustainability has to be part of their brand now. There's just no way around it. That's what we're seeing uh, from uh, corporates who want to be our customers in uh, for, for the insetting model, right? So it means, okay, we just need to also reach the consumers, right? And then we have the chain complete because a farmer will not produce something that he cannot sell. I think it's a it's a good moment to uh, to end. I want to thank you, Anna, so much for your time um, to to explain what a satellite grazing app is and and how does it work, insetting versus offsetting, um, how grazing can be a huge part of the solution, uh, which we all know. But then, how do we practically get there? Which is a, a very different question. And uh, I, I want to definitely keep um, uh, send. I will send an invite at some point to do the philosophical urban versus rural <laughs> and migrant generational divide uh, and to uh, I will take you uh, I'll take you up on that at some point but thank you so much for now and good luck with building thank you very much for having me thank you so much for listening all the way to the end for the show notes and links discussed check out our website investing in regenerative agriculture.com forward slash post Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you liked this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.